I am here with Dr. Tyler Burge, who is a philosophy professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you, Dr. Burge, for meeting with us. Well, thank you for um, listening to me. Your ideas are in your new book entitled Perception, First Form of the Mind. No, no, no V in the title. First Form of Mind. Oh, well, okay. That's good for me to know. I will just cross that out and there you put go. it. Thank you. Yeah. I want to focus on perception. There's lots of different kinds of examples for how people perceive. What exactly are we learning about in your book? Well, I focus on visual perception because. This is the best known uh, type of perception. It's studied vastly more in science than the others, although all the others have bodies of research on them. Um, it's also the perception that played the largest role in the development of science itself. So physics, chemistry, and so on were based more on perception than the others. But other types of perception are, of course, humanly and for other animals, enormously important. Um, so I say some things that I think apply to all types of perception, but the bulk of the focus is on vision. You say in your book and in detail explain the iconic nature of perception. What exactly does that mean, that perception is iconic? Yeah, well, explaining it in detail, I think might try your listener's patience. But the basic idea is there are aspects of perception that map naturally onto the subject matter of perception. Um, that This term map is both a mathematical term, but it also alludes to what goes on in actual, say, roadmaps. So there's a correspondence between parts of the roadmap and the territory that the map maps. So for example, the length of a red line on the map, which, which uh, represents a road, is proportionate on the map to the length of the uh, length of the road. A shorter line on the map will indicate a, a shorter road. And similarly, directional relations are maintained on the map. Um, and size of territory relations are maintained on the map. Well, something like this goes on in perception, visual image, um, which is an aspect of perception, um, maps onto aspects of the environment. For example, the lower part of your visual field maps onto the lower part of what you're seeing, and the upper part maps onto the upper part of what you're seeing. Uh, this doesn't occur with sentences. Um, so the order of a sentence doesn't necessarily correspond to any temporal or spatial order at all. You can rearrange a sentence, uh, make it passive instead of active and so on. There's nothing about a sentence that forces it to map in a natural way onto what it is about. You talk about how there's a deep relationship between the iconic format and the representational content. Yes. Can you tell us more about what is that representational content when dealing with the iconic nature of perception? Yeah, well, look, the representational content is the aspect of the perception, or it's a kind of perception, it bears on what is 
how how what is represented is represented. Um, so the content of a map would involve representation of something as a road, um, representing the length of the road and so on. Um, so these are things we can characterize in English, of course, I just did, but um, the content and, and the content of both maps and perception share things with English. So we have the word road, but we also have that line on the map, which means road. Um, and similarly, the length of the line on the map means the length of the, the, main, the length of the road. Similarly, um, uh, we just said that in English, but then there's something similar in, in perception. The perception maps onto the world and has a meaning, uh, which you might say roughly is the representational content that um, itself maps onto the subject matter. And you say that perceptual constancy is the first mark of a representational mind. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, I'll try. Um, well, let's see. First, um, it really alludes to the fact that I think perception is the simplest um, and evolutionarily first developed aspect of mind. So perception evolved sooner than thought, for example. Um, millions and millions of years ago, there were insects that have perceptual capacities. And the insects did not do any real thinking. They did not do deductive reasoning or anything like that. There's absolutely no scientific basis for thinking that they do, but there's very substantial scientific basis for thinking that <clears throat> insects, certain insects, um, have perception. Um, so first marked alludes to the fact that it's the, it's the simplest type of representation in the mind and the first that was the first that evolved. Um, I think this is a matter of knowledge. It's not a matter of sort of philosophical spe speculation. It's really based on scientific, um, scientific results. Um, now, Mark, first Mark, Mark is a essential condition. Um, I take perceptual constancies, which I'll explain in a minute, um, to be a necessary um, and sufficient condition for having a representational mind and for having perception, which is the first type of representational mind. So a mark is, is just a property that is basic to what is a mark of. Here, perceptual constancy is a basic uh, feature of perception. Um, and what's useful about it is that it's, it's a feature that can be studied and is studied in science. So we can ask in the abstract, well, where, where does perception begin? And we can mean all kinds of things by the word perception, but I'm linking the ordinary term perception with the scientific term perceptual constancy, which will guide us in determining where in the world we can find perception. Uh, uh, both in human beings and in insects, as it turns out, uh, and many other animals in between. Okay, now perceptual constancy. This is the hardest one. 
Um, perceptual constancy is a capacity. It's a, but it's a very complex capacity. It's a capacity to produce a whole range of psychological states, a whole range of perceptual states. So a perceptual constancy is not any one perception. It's not any one perceptual state. It's a capacity to produce a whole range of perceptual states. Now, what, what is the range here? Um, Good question. <laughs> yes. OK. So to belong to a range, a relevant range, all of the perceptual states represent a given a specific um, property in the environment. So for example, all the perceptual states in the range represent a certain size or a certain shape or a certain color or a certain position with respect to the viewer. So those are examples of properties in the environment that perception will represent. Now, each property that is represented, let's say a given size, a particular size, is represented in many different perceptions. So the same size can be represented by many different perceptual states. Each perceptual state is caused in a different way by, let's say for vision, by the light hitting the eyes. So a different pattern of light can hit the eyes. And in one pattern, the perceptual state represents that size, but another pattern of light can lead to a perceptual state that represents the same size. So all of these perceptual states in the range have in common that they represent that size, all right? Now, what's striking about this capacity to represent a whole range of perceptual states, all of which rep represent a given property, is that it's not straight, it's not an easy capacity to have. For example, let's look at an example. So use the size example. Whether an object is a long way away, let's say, 50 yards away or 20 yards away, or whether it's right up close to your nose, um, your perceptual system without any background knowledge or any sort of calculation or inference on your part, your perceptual system can automatically determine that the size of an object is the same, is a given size, whether it's 20 yards away or right up in front of your nose, maybe eight inches away. Um, so that's a remarkable capacity because notice that the light that's hitting the eyes, so the proportion of the light that's hitting the eyes um, in the far away case is much smaller than the amount of light that's coming off that sized object and it hits the eyes when it's closer together. So you look at a piece of paper 20 yards away or look at it up close, the size of the light coming from that piece of paper coming into your eyes and the size of the object in the image um, that hits your eyes will be very different, right? We say it looks, in one sense, it looks smaller when it's farther away and closer. But although that's true in a way, it's also true that the perceptual state can represent the thing as the same size. Um, and that's true for many other properties. Same shape, whether the shape is straight on, say a square piece of paper, whether it's sort of tilted and slanted, with respect to you, it can represent um, perceptually the very same shape, even though the way the shape is conveyed to us by the light is very different. 
So perceptual constancy is a really remarkable capacity, which is, I think, fundamental to, to perception. And when a scientist can find that an animal has a perceptual constancy, then it's got good evidence, I think the size of evidence, that the perception that the animal has perception of the property that is at the center of the perceptual constancy. I hope that isn't too long and complex, but uh, I, I think this is in a way the most important phenomenon that the book describes. I have a whole chapter discussing perceptual constancies. Yes, moving on from the capacity to the accuracy of perceptual states. You talk about how the perceptual state could be accurate, inaccurate, and you give a third category, partly accurate and partly inaccurate. Yes. Can you talk more about this? Yes, really there th there's another dimension that you don't mention there. There's accuracy, approximate accuracy and serious inaccuracy. So for example, when seeing that size at a distance, um, your perceptual system won't get it exactly right. But what's impressive, what counts as the perceptual constancy is your, your perceptual system will get it very close to right, even though the stimulus is enormously different. So in general, yeah, approximate accuracy is what perception mostly gives us. Sometimes it gives us exact accuracy, but the science is often uh, focused on approximate accuracy. Okay, so let's look at the cases of, that you started with. Um, any given perceptual state will be any normal perceptual state will represent many different things at once. Um, so that perceptual state of the paper's size um, will also represent it as having a, the, the paper is having a given um, shape and a distance uh, and a location and a degree of twist or orientation um, with respect to the viewer and so on. So many, and color, uh, the color of the, of, the, of the object will be represented and the surface will be represented. And usually um, we represent 3D um, objects with facing surfaces, but we represent them as 3D, so not only 2D shapes, but 3D shapes. So all of these things are going on at once in any given perception. Um, now, a perception could get one property right and miss another property. So for example, you could get the shape of the, of the paper right, but get its color quite wrong. Uh, you, you might, have an illusion of the, because the lighting is really peculiar, you might perceive a red um, piece, red piece of paper is brown, for example, uh, or even green. Um, that'd be quite unusual, but it could happen. But at the same time, you could be getting the shape of the paper right. So that would be an, an example of partly accurate and partly inaccurate. Um, some perceptions are kind of inaccurate all the way down. You could have an illusion where you have an illusion of there being an elephant in front of you. Um, you're drunk, you know, and the elephant is flying around the air and so on. Um, this could be not a perception, but some kind of other pathology, but in principle, it could be a perception. Uh, then in that case, you wouldn't even perceive anything. And let, we could even imagine every one of the properties that you represented the object is having just wasn't there. So 
there's a whole degree of getting everything right, which almost never happens, and getting nothing right, lots of stuff in between. The main thing that's of interest to the scientist is getting certain specific properties that are studied approximately right. And a theme throughout the book, eight, all 800 pages, is essentially that you're giving us a new way of understanding our capacity of perception that's in opposition to what other people have said in the past. And when you're talking about the Locke, Hume, classical empiricist way that needs to be updated with the psychophysics of perception, you say that they're misguided when it comes to perception and conception. Yes. Can you talk to us more about this opposition going on in the background? Yes. Um, yes, that's a major theme in the book. It's clear that you've uh, read the book with some intelligence, so thank you. Uh, okay, so Locke and Hume were serious, um, smart philosophers, and they were trying to get a science of perception started. Um, but neither one of them had the techniques needed to do so. They, essentially relied on introspection. They didn't do experiments. They just sort of reflected on what perception is like, what it seemed like to them. And they generated theories about what it was like. And this method, not surprisingly, is not gonna get you very far um, because most of what goes on in perception is entirely unconscious and goes on too fast for one to introspect it. Of course, the end product of perception, much of the time we have conscious perceptions, of course, I've got conscious perceptions right now and I can introspect them, but I can't introspect how they were produced. Um, what is the causal path that led from the light hitting the eyes to the perceptions? That's the that's the center of the science, describing that causal sequence. And introspection won't give you any insight into that sequence at all, except by looking at the end product. So that's one problem with their, with their approach. Um, uh, so that kind of method is, is not present in the science anymore, or rather, it's a very minority method. It's not that science completely avoids using introspection, but it always tries to provide other evidence that corresponds to and props up our intuitive introspective judgments because the intuitive introspective judgments aren't fully trusted. You have to use them to some extent. For example, you have to ask a subject what it's like, what, the, what is the subject seeing, and so on. And that's a kind of introspective report by the, by the subject. But there are many other ways of testing um, the subject's perceptual system than asking the subject questions. For example, you can study the brain pathways that lead from the, from the light hitting the receptors in the eyes and track them and one can interrupt perception in various ways. So all, all kinds of methods uh, are used by the science that Locke and Hume simply did not have. Okay, so that's the big background. I should say that Locke and Hume did get right the iconic aspect of perception. I don't think they described it in any real detail, but they were on to the idea that perception as an image-like or map-like of uh, character. Now, the thing about perception and conception is this. They, they took perception to be very concrete ideas and conception to be very abstract ideas. 
So the difference between perception and conception for these people, so roughly conception is thought, right? So if we're thinking very crudely, we have perception and then we have thought. Some animals only have perception. They don't think those the insects again. Um, but Locke and Hume took perception and conception to be available to human beings and most of us do too. But they thought of it as a kind of spectrum, a matter of degree, not a matter of kind. Um, so the perceptions were the concrete ideas and the conceptions were the were abstract ideas. Well, that sounds all right in a way. We, we can engage in abstract thought that we don't engage in when we perceive. And it seems like when we perceive, the perceptions are really concrete. They're right here and the here and now. Um, but when you push this distinction a little bit, uh, it really doesn't hold up very well. So perception involves grouping. Grouping is holding different cases together. Um, and there are various types of grouping. For example, um, we perceive a very specific shade of a color, very specific shade of red. Um, but the perceptual system also groups this, might group it as red. There are all kinds of shades of red, um, but the perceptual system will group many shades together as a single important group or category. So let's call that the red category. Um, so we have this in English. We have you know, scarlet, that's a pretty specific, not the very most specific shade of red, but a specific shade of red, and we have the term red. But perception has this too. Perception represents the very most specific shades of red, but also groups these shades at higher levels of abstraction, you might say. I think I argue actually that the perceptual system even represents things as colored. So I think color, color is a very abstract seeming category, but I think that the perceptual system um, takes colored things as being a significant grouping. Um, so this idea that perception has to be concrete all the time is not really right. It can be not as abstract as thought. Thought, we can think about numbers and we can't perceive things as numbers, right? But um, there are lots of levels of abstraction in perception. And in the reverse direction, thought can be extremely concrete. You can pick out the very most um, specific shade of a color and think about how that color represented in thought will fit with other colors in your decorating scheme in your living room. You can do quite abstract, detailed reasoning about how it will fit in with your plans and your budget and, and so on, all the while representing that very concrete um, shade, of, shade of red. So, thought or conception can go very concrete as well as abstract and perception can go fairly abstract as well as concrete. And I think uh, Locke and Hume simply not knowing very much about perception uh, sort of runs over these, these points and produces this very crude uh, spectrum which I don't think captures the difference between perception and thought or conception at all. One more word on this. Um, Kant, who's a later philosopher after Locke and Hume, did make a sharp distinction of kind between perception and thought. He's the first, there's a little bit of this in Leibniz, but Kant is the first philosopher, I think, who very sharply distinguishes between perception and thought. And although Kant wasn't a scientist, um, for 
somehow he had the insight, or maybe he was just lucky. I don't think it's true that he was just lucky, but he had the insight that there was a sharp, important, deep distinction between perception and thought. And I think that's turning out to be right, but it has to do with the function and form of thought versus the function and form of perception. It doesn't have to do with levels of abstraction or anything like that. Dr. Tyler Burge, thank you so much. Thank you for, for um, interviewing me in such an intelligent way. I hope uh, some of what I say got across and gets people interested to go read the book. <laughs>